This hearing will now come to order. Without objection, all members' opening statements will be made a part of the record. The chair notes that some members may have additional questions for the panel which they may wish to submit in writing. Without objection, the hearing record will remain open for 30 days for members to submit written questions to these witnesses and to place their responses in the record. I now recognize myself for uh, five minutes to make an opening statement. First, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Kamen and Mr. Dudley for appearing today on, to visit on a very important subject that the uh, world is looking at constantly, a major debt crisis that exists around the world. And it has a great deal of significance, uh, not only for world finance, but it also has a great deal of significance for the American taxpayer, the value of the U.S. dollar, and uh, indirectly uh, the, the deficits that are run up because they're all interconnected. The crisis we face right now is a um, crisis in debt and uh, how we, how we uh, handle this debt who gets stuck with the debt, who, 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 gets, who gets the bailout, how does the debt get defaulted on, how do you liquidate debt. And there are different ways of liquidating debt. Uh, when you can't pay the bills and you write them off the books, that's liquidating debt, and that helps to solve the problem. Other times, governments and uh, central banks participate in, in liquidating debt by uh, diminishing real debt, and that is by purposely uh, devaluing the currency. And of course, that, that has been used historically many, many times, and is one of the most common ways of liquidating debt. So if you can devalue a currency by 50%, you can get rid of real debt by half if your prices go up. And uh, there, there certainly seems to be a concerted effort around the world, even within our own country, to handle debt uh, in that fashion. But in the process, the question really is, is who gets stuck with it? Who, 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 has the most, uh, who gets the most penalties? And uh, if, if you happen to be on the receiving end of being too big, uh, too big to fail, and you uh, get some benefits from the system, and, but the debt is not liquidated, it's passed on, it, it's transferred from, uh, uh, from one group of individuals uh, off to another. But uh, nevertheless, it's still uh, a pain, but it's just a matter of picking and choosing who, who will receive the most uh, uh, harm. The problem I see right now in, in dealing uh, with uh, this debt crisis is um, can, can the U.S. dollar and the U.S. economy and the U.S. taxpayer bear the burden and, and this, is, this is the way it seems because now uh, the um, uh, European uh, Central Bank uh, is, is asking us, uh, as we continue to do over these last few years, to uh, use, that's a shame, to, um, to use the, uh, the dollar to uh, actually bail, bail them out. Uh, and, and yet, on paper, it looks like uh, the balance sheet is, is better with the Europeans. Their uh, assets uh, uh, to capital ratio is, is, is better than, than our bank. And yet, the dependency is for the United States to bail them out. And it seems like it's working. Of course, we have the advantage of being the reserve, issuing the reserve currency of the world, which has given us, uh, in a deceptive way, some advantages over many, many decades. But the big question is, how long can that happen? Uh, can we always have the benefits? Will other countries finally get together, as they talk about constantly, and replace the dollar? And uh, certainly, the dollar isn't getting to be a stronger reserve currency. If anything, it's getting slightly weaker, and someday there may be some real, uh, real challenges uh, to the dollar. So there has to be a limit to this. And uh, we talk about the, the Greek crisis, which is major and significant, and we're dealing with it on a daily basis. But this might just be the beginning uh, 
of, of a much bigger crisis when you look at uh, the different countries, whether it's uh, Portugal or Spain or Italy. And this thing uh, could, uh, I, I think it's, it's much bigger than we're willing to admit. In many, many ways, I think we're in denial of how serious uh, th this problem is. So uh, we, we have to face up to the fact that there is a cost uh, I see it's going to be a cost against the value of the dollar. Now, some people say, well, this is good. We want a weaker dollar because it's going to help our trade. It's going to help our exports. And now there are currency wars going on. I mean, all we do is complain about, uh, you know, the Chinese having too weak a currency. At the same time, we triple our balance sheet and say, you know, at, at triple the, at the monetary base. Uh, now, that's deliberately trying to weaken currency, too. So there will be limits on that. I think we're facing that. We're up against the wall on this. And, and very soon, uh, I think we're going to have to admit that you can't solve the problem of debt with more debt. You can't solve the problem of a weak currency by making the currency even weaker. You can't solve the problem by having the moral hazard of a guaranteed bailout uh, uh, that uh, people always has the lender of last resort. And if you're too big to fail, you're going to be taken care of. Some people may suffer, but others will be taken care of. I think there's limits. I think we're facing that. I think we're in denial. We won't admit how serious it is. But I believe that we will be forced to, not because of the politics of it as much as because of the economics. Economic, I complain about the power of governments and, and central banks. But ultimately, uh, there's economic rules and laws. Economic laws are probably much stronger than all of us. And uh, you can't dictate and mandate uh, forever. You can kid people for a long time, but right now it's an illusion that we can trust the dollar to bail out the world, and soon we're going to see the end of that, and that's why uh, many of us believe that the crisis is far from over and that we have to face up to those facts. Now I'd like to uh, recognize uh, Mr. Clay for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Paul, and thank you for holding this hearing to examine the Federal Reserve's assistance to the Eurozone and the effect of the assistance on the U.S. economy, mon monetary system, and the dollar. The focus of this hearing is to examine the Federal Reserve's central bank's currency swap line arrangements with central banks of Europe, England, Switzerland, Japan, and Canada. Also, I want to thank the witnesses for appearing before us today. When the new Greek government came into power in late 2009, they revealed that the previous Greek government had not been reporting the budget deficit accurately. Uh, this has led to major economic challenges and concerns to other parts of Europe and the United States. The first concern is the high levels of public debt in some Eurozone countries. Three Eurozone nations governments, Greece, Ireland, and Portugal, have had to borrow money uh, from the European Central Bank and the International Monetary Fund in order to avoid defaulting on their debt. Currently, the Greek government is negotiating losses on bonds held by private creditors. Investors have started to demand higher interest rates for buying and holding Italian and Spanish bonds. The Italian government debt is, is forecast to be $2.8 billion in 2012, greater than Spain, Portugal, Greece, and Ireland combined. The second concern is the lack of growth and high unemployment in the Eurozone. In January of this year, the IMF downgraded its growth forecast for the Eurozone by growing, from growing by 1.1% in 2012 to contracting by 0.5%. The third concern is the weakness in the Eurozone's banking system, which holds high levels of public debt. In December of last year, the European Banking Authority estimated that European banks need about $152 billion in additional capital in order to withstand a range of shocks and still maintain adequate capital. The fourth concern is the persistent trade imbalances within the Eurozone. The Eurozone core countries tend to run trade surpluses with the Eurozone periphery countries, and the periphery countries tend to run trade deficits with the core countries. 
to help, to help ease the financial crisis in the Eurozone, the Federal Reserve opened the currency swap line. Under a swap line with the European Central Bank, the uh, ECB it temporarily receives U.S. dollars and the Federal Reserve temporarily receives euros. After a fixed period of time, the transaction is reversed. Interest on swaps is paid to the Federal Reserve at the rate that the foreign central bank charges to its dollar borrowers. The temporary swaps are repaid at the exchange rate prevailing at the time of the original swap, meaning that there is no downside risk for the Federal Reserve if the dollar appreciates in the meantime. All of these concerns have raised questions about the economic stability of the Eurozone country, and I look forward to the witnesses' comments regarding these concerns and actions taken by the Federal Reserve Bank to address these concerns. And again, thank you for conducting this hearing. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I'll now I recognize Mr. Lukemeyer from Missouri <coughs> for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Over the past several years, many of my colleagues and I have expressed serious concerns regarding U.S. exposure to the Eurozone. Like many of my colleagues, my concerns have been met at times with cynicism and assurances of an efficient recovery with little or no contagion. Yet here we sit today, continuing to talk about the Eurozone crisis and hearing once again that our nation won't be dramatically impacted. Certain scholars and federal officials said that the crisis wouldn't spread. It has now impacted several European nations with effects ranging from default and upheaval in Greece to bank failures and increased risks in the perceived financial stalwart of France. This has undoubtedly taken a toll on U.S. markets and I believe has the potential to take a toll on our nation's economy as a whole. Chairman Bernanke testified recently in this committee that the two greatest threats to our economy are rising gas prices and the Eurozone problems. Secretary Geithner testified in this committee just last week and seemed concerned as well about the possibility of a zero zone, Eurozone contagion. Although he was optimistic, things would work themselves out. Regardless of what we hear today, we are in fact exposed. Our financial institutions, industries, and government are all exposed, and as a result, so are the taxpayers. Our economies are and always will be deeply connected. It is our responsibility to ensure that this exposure is managed thoughtfully and to ensure that the U.S. taxpayers are not again on the hook for the failure of the financial institutions, not only domestic, but foreign as well. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to a live discussion with our panel. This is an important topic and one that merits great transparency and attention. I thank you and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Now I'd like to introduce our witnesses for today. Mr. William Dudley is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Before taking over as President of the New York Fed in 2009, Mr. Dudley had been Executive Vice President of the Markets Group at the New York Fed, where he managed the system's open market account for the Federal Open Market Committee. Prior to joining the New York Fed in 07, Mr. Dudley was a partner and managing director at Goldman Sachs and Company and was Goldman's chief U.S. economist for a decade. Mr. Dudley also serves as chairman of the Committee on Payments and Settlement Systems of the Bank of International Settlements and as a member of the board of directors of the Bank for International Settlements. Mr. Dudley received his bachelor degree from New, New College of Florida and his Ph.D. in economics from the University of uh, California, Berkeley. Dr. Stephen Kamen is the Director of the Division of International Finance for the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. He joined the uh, Federal Reserve System uh, Board in 1987 and was appointed to the official staff in 1999. Prior to taking over the Division of International Finance in December of 2011, Dr. Kamen was Deputy Director of the Division. He has also served as a visiting economist at the Bank of International Settlement, a senior economist for international financial affairs at the Council of Economic Advisors, and as a consultant for the World Bank. Dr. Kamen received his bachelor's degree from the University of California, Berkeley, and received his PhD in economics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Without objection, your written statements will be made a part of the record. You will now be recognized for a five-minute summary of your testimony. Uh, Mr. Dudley. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Paul, Ranking Member Clay, and members of the subcommittee, my name is Bill Dudley, and I'm the President of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. It's an honor to testify today about the economic and fiscal challenges facing Europe and the Federal Reserve's efforts to support financial stability in the United States. 
Let me preface these remarks by stating that the views expressed in my written and oral testimony are solely my own and do not re represent the official views of the Federal Reserve Board, the Federal Open Market Committee, or any other part of the Federal Reserve System. Additionally, because I'm precluded by law from discussing confidential supervisory information, I will not be able to speak about the financial condition or regulatory treatment or rating of any individual financial institution. The economic situation in Europe has been unsettled for the better part of two years with pressure on sovereign debt markets and local banking systems. The strains in European markets have affected the U.S. economy. The euro area has the capacity, including the fiscal capacity, to overcome its challenges. However, the politics are very difficult, both because the problem has many dimensions and because many different countries and institutions in the euro area have to coordinate their actions in order to achieve a coherent and effective policy response. Europe's leadership has affirmed its commitment to the European Union and a single currency union on numerous occasions, and the leadership is working harder than ever to ch achieve greater policy coordination in areas such as fiscal policy. A more robust and resilient European Union would be a welcome development for the United States. Three recent developments are especially encouraging in that regard. First, liquidity concerns have eased significantly following the European Central Bank's long-term financing operations in December and February. Through this program, the ECB provides three-year loans to European banks at low rates, accepting a wider range of collateral in return. Second, earlier this month, the Greek government, work, working with European leaders and its largest creditors, to, structure, to restructure the bulk of its 206 billion euros of outstanding privately held bonds. This not only helped reduce Greeks' total indebtedness, it also helped calm persistent worries that a disorderly Greek default could become the trigger for global economic crisis. Third, leaders in most euro area countries have approved a new treaty designed to increase fiscal coordina coordination. The new rules already appear to be making a difference. While difficult work still lies ahead, countries in the euro area have made meaningful progress towards achieving long-term fiscal sustainability. Looking to the future, the difficult work that remains also presents special risks, both for Europe and for the United States. If Europe fails to chart an effective course forward, this could have a number of negative implications here. In particular, there are three areas of potential risk that I would like to highlight for the subcommittee today. First, if economic conditions in Europe were to weaken significantly, the demand for U.S. exports would decrease. This would hurt domestic growth and have a negative impact on U.S. jobs. It's important to recognize that the euro area is the world's second largest economy after the United States, and it's an important trading partner for us. Also, Europe is a significant investor in the U.S. economy and vice versa. Second, deterioration in the European economy would, could put pressure on the U.S. banking system. As the recent round of stress tests revealed, U.S. banks are much more robust and resilient than they were a few years ago. They have bolstered their capital significantly, built up their loan loss reserves, and have significantly higher liquidity buffers. The good news in the United States means that we are better able to handle bad news from Europe. With that said, the exposures of U.S. banks climb sharply when one also considers their exposures to the core European countries and to the overall European banking system. Third, severe stresses in European financial markets would disrupt financial markets here, which could harm the real economy. Stress in the financial markets causes banks to more carefully husband their balance sheets. When that phenomenon occurs, the availability of credit to U.S. households and businesses becomes constrained. Such conditions could also cause equity prices to fall, impairing the value of Americans' pension and 401k holdings. This would damage the U.S. recovery and result in slower output growth and less job creation. At a time when the U.S. employment rate is very high, this is a particularly unacceptable outcome. In the extreme, U.S. financial markets could become so impaired that the flow of credit to households and businesses could dry, dry up. In today's globally integrated economy, banks headquartered abroad play an important role in providing credit and other financial services in the United States. About $1 trillion in worldwide dollar financing comes from foreign banks, $700, million, 700 billion in the form of loans within the U.S. For these banks to provide U.S. dollar loans, they have to maintain access to U.S. dollar funding. At a time when it's already hard enough for American families and, and businesses to get the credit they need, we have a strong interest in making sure that these banks can continue to be active in U.S. dollar markets. It's in our national interest to make sure that non-U.S. Non banks remain able to access the U.S. dollar funding that they need to be able to continue to finance their U.S. dollar assets. If access to dollar funding were to become severely impaired, 
This could necessitate the abrupt forced sales of dollar assets by these banks, which could seriously disrupt U.S. markets and adversely affect American businesses, consumers, and jobs. One way we can help to support the availability of dollar funding and ensure that the credit continues to flow to American households and businesses is by engaging in currency swaps with other central banks. Such swaps are a policy tool that the Federal Reserve has used to support dollar liquidity for nearly 50 years. More recently, the Federal Reserve established dollar swap lines with major central banks during the global financial crisis of 2008, and we reactivated them again in May 2010. The swaps are intended to create a credible backstop to support but not supplant private markets. Banks with surplus dollars are more likely to lend to banks in need of dollars if they know that the borrowing bank will be able to obtain the dollars it needs to repay the loan, if necessary, from its central bank. Our principal aim is to protect U.S. banks, businesses, and consumers from adverse economic trends abroad. I'm pleased that the swaps seem to be working. In conjunction with the ECB's long-term refinancing operations, the swaps have helped European banks avoid the significant liquidity pressures we feared a few months ago, and they have reduced the risk that they would need to sell off their U.S. dollar assets abruptly. In conclusion, I'm hopeful that the Euro Europe can effectively address its current fiscal challenges. The Federal Reserve is actively and carefully assessing this situation and the potential impact on the U.S. economy. At this time, I Although I do not anticipate further efforts by the Federal Reserve to address the potential spillover effects of Europe on the United States, we will continue to monitor the situation closely. Thank you for your invitation to testify today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Dudley. And uh, Dr. Kamen. Uh, thank you, Chairman Paul. Ranking, um, um, well, is your mic um, on? Excuse me? I, is your mic oh, on? Sure. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Paul and members of the subcommittee for inviting me to talk about the economic situation in Europe and the actions taken by the Federal Reserve in response to this situation. In the past several months, European authorities have provided additional liquidity to banks, bolstered bank capital requirements, developed rules to strengthen fiscal discipline, and explored means of enlarging the euro area financial backstop. Stresses in financial markets have eased, but these markets remain under strain. The fiscal and financial strains in Europe have spilled over to the United States by restraining our exports, depressing confidence, and adding to pressures on U.S. financial markets. Of note, foreign financial institutions, especially those in Europe, have found it more difficult to borrow dollars. These institutions make loans to U.S. households and firms, as well as to borrowers in other countries who use those loans to purchase U.S. goods and services. While strains have eased somewhat of late, Difficulties borrowing dollars by European institutions may make it harder for U.S. households and firms to get loans and for U.S. businesses to sell their products abroad. Moreover, these disruptions could spill over into U.S. money markets, raising the cost of funding for U.S. financial institutions. To address these risks to the United States, on November 30, the Federal Reserve announced, jointly with the European Central Bank, or ECB, and the central banks of Canada, Japan, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom, that it would revise, extend, and expand its swap lines with these institutions. The measures were motivated by the need to ease strains in global financial markets, which, if left unchecked, could impair the supply of credit to households and businesses in the United States and impede our economic recovery. Three steps were described in the announcement. First, we reduced the pricing of the dollar swap lines from a spread of 100 basis points over the overnight index swap rate to 50 basis points over that rate. This has enabled foreign central banks to reduce the cost of the dollar loans they provide to financial institutions in their jurisdictions. This, in turn, has helped alleviate global financial strains and put foreign institutions in a better position to maintain their supply of credit, including to U.S. residents. Second, we extended the closing date for these lines from August 1, 2012 to February 1, 2013 demonstrating that central banks are prepared to work together for a sustained period to support global liquidity conditions. Third, we agreed to establish swap lines in the currencies of other participating central banks. These lines would allow the Federal Reserve to draw foreign currencies and provide them to U.S. financial institutions on a secured basis. U.S. financial institutions are not experiencing any foreign currency liquidity pressures at present, but we judged it prudent to make such arrangements should the need arise in the future. Information on the swap lines is fully disclosed on the websites of the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. I also want to underscore that the swap transactions are safe and secure. 
First, the swap transactions present no exchange rate or interest rate risk because the terms of each drawing and repayment are set at the time the draw is initiated. Second, each drawing on the swap lines must be approved by the Fed, providing us with control over use of the facility. Third, the foreign currency held by the Fed during the term of the swap provides an important safeguard. Fourth, our counterparties are the foreign central banks, not the private institutions to which the central banks lend. The Fed's history of close interaction with these central banks provides a track record justifying a high degree of trust and cooperation. Finally, the short tenor of the swaps means that positions could be wound down relatively quickly were it judged appropriate to do so. Notably, the Fed has not lost a penny on these swap lines since they were established in 2007. In fact, fees on these swaps have added to the earnings that the Fed remits to taxpayers. To conclude, following the changes we made to our swap line arrangements last November, the amount of dollar funding through the swap lines increased substantially. Subsequently, as measures of dollar funding costs declined, usage of the swap lines has fallen back. Ultimately, however, a sustained further easing of financial strains here and abroad will require European authorities to follow through on their policy commitments in the months ahead. We are closely monitoring events in Europe and their spillovers to the U.S. economy and financial system. Thank you again for inviting me to appear before you today. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. I, I, I thank you, Dr. Kamen. I'll start off with the uh, uh, questioning uh, for uh, Mr. Dudley. I wanted to see if we could start off by seeing if we could agree with what, what the problem is. And uh, in my opening statement, I emphasize that, that the debt is the problem, that we're in a worldwide debt crisis. Uh, do you generally agree with that, and how serious do you think it is? I think you're certainly correct that there's a, a, a question of uh, debt sustainability uh, in Europe in terms of uh, the fiscal budget deficit path for some countries, some countries, not all countries, some countries. And uh, there's also, and that's also implicated the, some of the European banks that have large exposures to, the, to that sovereign debt. And so what's important is that these co countries have an opportunity uh, to undertake the fiscal consolidations that they need to demonstrate to the market that they can actually be on a sustainable path. Uh, the ECB's long-term refinancing operations and I think the dollar swaps have helped create some time for this to take place. But for this to work out well, these countries still have to take the appropriate steps. But so far, if we date the crisis back to 2008 and 2009, um, and if it, uh, if it was a debt crisis that was a problem, if you look at everybody's debt, I mean, it's exploding, including ours. So how, how do you solve the problem of debt with uh, exponentially increasing the debt? It seems like our problems just they're compounded. How do you get around to uh, either stop accumulating more debt, or do you believe you have to liquidate debt? Uh, is it necessary? To, some people believe you have to get rid of the debt in order to get growth again because the debt will consume us. And, uh, you know, interest rates are bumping up already, and, and ultimately, like I said in my opening statement, uh, the, the Fed will have some, some ability to manipulate interest rates and, and the economy, but ultimately the economic laws are pretty powerful, uh, so interest rates are liable to go up. So how, how, can we, how can we solve the problem of debt with more debt? Uh, and what is your opinion about liquidating debt? Is that important? Well, I think that you're, you're right, that obviously more debt does not solve the problem of too much debt. Uh, I think the good news in the United States, and I'll speak for the United, about the United States, is that there's actually been a significant amount of deleveraging that's actually taken place among U.S. households after, over, over the last few years. Debt to income ratios have come down. Debt service relative to income has come down. So U.S. households, I think, are in significantly better shape than they were a, a few years ago. The second area where we see a pretty big change in terms of uh, deleveraging in the United States is in the state of uh, health of the U.S. banking system. U.S. banks, compared to five or six years ago, have much more capital and much bigger liquidity buffers. So I think that while the I think it's too soon to say that the deleveraging process in, in the United States is over, uh, we've made a considerable amount of progress in working our way out of the problems that we faced in 2007 and 2008. 
But, but isn't it true that mortgage debt is still on the books? It's been transferred. Maybe uh, the Fed owns that debt. Uh, we don't even know what the real value is of most of it. And banks still hold some mortgage debt, and it might be at a nominal value. So in that sense of that debt being liquidated, maybe some individuals have straightened up their bank accounts. But there's still millions of people. If, if they really were improving, they could make their payments again. But uh, the debt is, is, is still the problem. But what about, you, you say that some are deleveraged, but has there been any real uh, liquidation of debt when it comes to mortgage and the derivatives? Because uh, governments are involved in that, either the central bank or you know some of our programs are involved. It seems like none of that has been deleveraged. If anything, that looks like it's getting worse. Well, on the mortgage front, there has been some deleveraging because banks have taken uh, mortgage losses. Uh, also, in certain cases, uh, especially among private holders of mortgage debt, there's been some uh, principal uh, forgiveness, principal reductions. Uh, so you've actually seen, for example, last year, household debt, total household debt is stand outstanding. Uh, according to the flow of funds, which is the broad, broadest measure of household credit, was roughly flat last year. So nominal GDP was growing. Debt was uh, debt that held by households was flat. So you're actually do, you're actually seeing the debt burden become less uh, less overwhelming. But we yes, um, but the the promises that we made and the involvement we have with with Europe that. Uh, that our finances are so good with our debt and uh, our dollar that we have been standing and saying, yes, we'll be there. I mean, the chairman of the Fed has said, you know, we're not ignoring this if necessary. We've been there before. We'll be back again. What is the limit to this? I mean, uh, what is the limit to us making these promises that we can always be available? Isn't there a limit to what the dollar will sustain? Won't eventually? Uh, it has to stop. Uh, or do you think we can do this, you know, if another crisis hit, there's a big downturn, you have to inject trillions of dollars again. What, what is the limiting factor to the dollar in the United States economy bailing out the world? Well, I think that from my perspective, we want to we make the decisions based on what's in our self-interest as a country, what's best for U.S. households and businesses. And in that calculation, if we decide that an intervention can, can help U.S. households and businesses has higher benefits than costs, then we, then we want to proceed. If we, don't, if we don't reach that calculation, if we think that there's too much risk involved in, in, in the program or that the program is going to lead to moral hazard and is going to be counterproductive, then we don't want to undertake it. So I don't think that uh, you know, the Federal Reserve has made any decisions about what future interventions we would or would not do, except that we'll do interventions that are consistent with our dual mandate as set by Congress to achieve maximum employment and price stability sustain financial stability in the U.S., and do what's best for households and businesses here. That's why we're doing this program. Not, not for Europe, but for, the, for ourselves. Mm. Uh, on, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, do you mind, could I add a few uh, words, Chairman Paul? Just, just to, uh, uh, to add to the uh, comments that President Dudley made, uh, our purpose uh, in the swap lines in particular is not to, in some sense, fully back or make whole uh, all the debts that have been accumulated around the world. Uh, that's very far from our purpose. Our key uh, strategy and our key intent in this regard is to make sure that foreign financial institutions could maintain the flow of credit, uh, both to U.S. households and firms and to firms and households around the world that in turn buy U.S. goods and services. So uh, the intent wa wa was mainly to, uh, to help alleviate the liquidity pressures that could that could uh, lead these foreign institutions to wind down their assets too quickly and thus injure uh, the U.S. recovery. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clay. Thank you, Dr. Paul. And let me follow Chairman Paul's line of questioning. Uh, Mr. Dudley, in your opening statement, you, you uh, mentioned that severe stress in European markets will create stress in the U.S. Uh, economy. Are, are we that tied to the European economy uh, and, and that married to that system that, uh, that it would have that kind of reaction, a chain reaction? Uh, 
I think we live in a global economy, and what happens in the other big economies of the world definitely affect us. As I noted in my testimony, there are sort of three channels by which Europe could affect us in a negative fashion. One, uh, if the European economy is uh, in recession or very weak, that is going to reduce the demand for our exports, so that has effects on U.S. production and employment here in the U.S. Number two, if Europe were to be in a, in a difficult position and the European banking system were to worsen, that would have consequences for U.S. banks that have exposure to the European banks. And third, if Europe were to perform badly, that would have negative effects on fin financial markets around the world, and that would have implication for our financial markets and therefore investment uh, and growth here in the United States. So there are definitely ch 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 significant channels by how Europe can affect the United States. Uh, Mr. Dudley, have, have actions taken by the Federal Reserve regarding the currency swap line arrangements been beneficial or detrimental to the U.S. economy? And uh, we think that the swap lines have had their desired effects because they have basically uh, given a, a, a source of a backstop to other sources of funding to European banks. So as a consequence of them be having this backstop available, if they were to need it, they don't have to be as fearful about their ability to obtain funding, and therefore they can manage their uh, loans, to, dollar loans, to U.S. businesses and households uh, in a more orderly f fashion. Uh, we follow uh, the, the activities of, of European banks in the U.S. through their U.S. branches and subsidiaries. And they are definitely uh, uh, reducing their exposure in the U.S., but I think because of the dollar swaps, this is happening in an orderly way rather than a disorderly way. And so we don't see that their reduction uh, in, the, in the business that they're doing in the U.S. is having any damaging effects on the U.S. economy, which is really what our goal is, to prevent any damaging effects on the U.S. economy. Okay. Mr. Kamen, you had something. Yes, thank you. If I could just add to those remarks. Uh, over the past uh, couple of years, uh, as the uh, uh, crisis in Europe has progressed, we have seen uh, several in, uh, periods when the financial situation in Europe uh, deteriorated fairly dramatically. And, 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 and during those periods, we could see some very obvious spillovers to financial markets, both in the United States and around the world. During those periods of deterioration, uh, investors became worried, and around the world they retreated uh, from assets they, they perceived to be more risky. And what that led to, both in Europe and the United States and elsewhere, were sharp declines in stock prices, increases in, in, uh, in interest rates on credit, and, and other developments that were associated with, with retreats from risk and flights to quality. So we have seen those episodes very clearly. Now, more recently, uh, since, the, uh, since we uh, changed the pricing of our swap lines, since the ECB introduced many measures to add liquidity to banks, and since European leaders have taken other actions, we have seen financial conditions in Europe, this is more or less since December, improve quite markedly. And that has been an important contributing factor to the improvement of the tone in financial markets in the United States. So those connections are definitely there. Dr. Kamen, share with us um, the, the effects that the rise in gasoline prices around the world and in the U.S. What effects will this rise in gas prices have on the, on the economies of Europe and the U.S.? Well, uh, the, the effects that uh, higher um, oil prices will have uh, on both the United States and on Europe are in, in broad qualitative terms relatively similar. Uh, both, uh, both broad economies uh, import oil. Um, there is a greater dependence of, on imported oil in Europe than in the United States, but both do. And so when oil prices rise, that acts as a tax on consumers of oil in both countries. And as a result, that diminishes the purchasing power that consumers in those countries have uh, to basically spend on other goods. And so it, it basically acts as a break on economic recovery, and all else equal may make it more difficult to create jobs. Uh, in addition to the effects on uh, unemployment and economic activity, increases um, in oil prices have the effect of, of raising at least, you know, at least some portion of the consumer basket of, of prices. Uh, 
As long as oil prices don't continue to rise, that should lead to a temporary increase in, uh, in inflation. Uh, but that also poses concerns. So obviously, uh, recent increases in oil and gasoline prices are something uh, you know, that we monitor very carefully. Thank you. And, uh, my time is up. I, th I thank the gentleman. Um, now I recognize Mr. Lukemeyer from Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, gentlemen, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe that the, uh, the swap uh, uh, dollars that are, I guess, euros that are on the other end with the European Central Bank, they secure those, do they not, whenever they loan them back out on their other end? And would you, would you agree that there is a problem from the standpoint that uh, what we've been told and what we find recently is they're taking a little bit more exposure, a little more risk with some of the investments that they're taking as collateral for those? Would, would that be a fair statement? They've broadened out the collateral eligibility, but they also have significant haircuts for that collateral. So they take more collateral than the value of the money that they're actually lending out. So, so that, instead of one to one and maybe two to one and they're taking additional so collateral. So they adjust for the, what they, <coughs> they perceive the quality of the collateral. Because I, I know that uh, former executive board member uh, Jurgen Stark recently said that the balance sheet of the ECBA is not only gigantic in dimension but also alarming in its quality. Would you agree with that statement? Uh, I, I don't have enough information to assess the quality of the ECB balance sheet, but my dealings with ECB suggest that they're quite prudent in terms of how they uh, run their operations. Yeah, but aren't you one of the leading swap lines between or, or leading experts on swaps between the uh, U.S. And, and Europe? But, but I, don't, I do not conduct the uh, daily operations of the ECB lending money to their banks versus collateral that they take. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the concerns that I have is with regards to, uh, you know, the, the quality of the, of, the, of the economies over there. You know, we keep talking about, well, they've, they've dodged the bullet, they're getting better, you know, they're improving. And yet we see, and we had, you know, Secretary Geithner just last week, and he acknowledged that the European continent as a whole is still struggling. I think uh, the comment was made in testimony today that it's, uh, it's a negative position as far as the growth of the economy yet. The, Greece is probably four-tenths of our four percent negative growth. Um, you know, it, it's fine to sit here and, re, and, and, and go through a, a workout and restructure your debt, but if you don't have the ability to repay it because you have an economy that can grow fast enough to repay it, where have you gone? I mean, I, I think we have to look at the, at the, at the revenue side you know, we may be able to restructure the debt so that they can, it, it can work, but if you don't have enough cash flow, enough re revenues coming in, we're still in trouble. Where, where do you see that going? Well, I, I certainly accept your uh, observation that the European economy is very weak, and uh, that weakness is going to persist for a while as these governments uh, engage in further fiscal actions to get their budget deficits on a sustainable course. Uh, but that fact, I, I think, in no way... Uh, creates risk for us in terms of our, our swap agreements with the European Central Bank. Uh, we think we are very well secured in th those transactions. Uh, we fully anticipate to be fully repaid. Uh, during the depths of the financial crisis in 2008 and 2009, far worse economic environment, which we are today, far greater amounts of the, uh, swaps outstanding. We were fully re repaid. We, so we didn't lose a penny. In fact, uh, the total uh, profit to the U.S. taxpayer through the swaps that were engaged in during that period was about $4 billion of profit to the U.S. taxpayer. Well, the point I'm getting to, though, if, is if, if you've got weak collateral for, this Europe for the European Central Bank swap lines and their economy is not going anywhere, that even gets, to me, that makes that, that you know, the debt that's, or the collateral that's securing that line even weaker. And so, therefore, well, we may have two to one or three to one. If you got nothing supply, you know, you got two or three times nothing, you know, securing the debt. That's pretty. That's pretty concerning to me. Um, quick question for you: Do you think that the swap lines enhance the uh, the dollar as a world reserve currency, or do you think it hurts it? Um, I think. It, I'd like a comment from both of you, please. I think it doesn't. I don't think it's a, a major factor, but I think at the margin, it probably enhances the dollar as a reserve currency. In other words, the fact that. Uh, the Federal Reserve is willing to engage in dollar swaps probably makes people more comfortable to use the dollars to finance international transactions around the world. I don't think this is a major factor, though, in terms of why we're engaging in swaps, or should it be a major factor in terms of why we're engaging in swaps? I think the main reason why we're engaging this in swaps is we don't want European banks to quickly exit their dollar lending business here in the U.S., and that exit causing harm to U.S. households and businesses. Dr. Kamen. 
if I could add to that. Um, <clears throat> um, so clearly, um, a you know key factors that are underpinning uh, the dollar's uh, status as a global reserve currency is the breadth, you know, and depth of uh, U.S. financial markets, and you know, including uh, but not limited, uh, you know, to the status of U.S. Treasuries. All that is underpinned by the vitality of the U.S. economy and its consistent record, you know, of being able to innovate and grow. Um, the purpose of the swap lines is ba is is ultimately focused on on continuing uh, to preserve the vitality of the American economy, and by by making sure that foreign financial institutions have the funding they need uh, to continue the flow of credit to American households and firms. So, uh, in so in so far then as the swap lines kind of contribute to the continued vitality, the continued recovery of the U.S. economy, it undoubtedly is a plus uh, as far as the dollar's reserve status. Although, as President Dudley has pointed out, it's probably one of many factors and not necessarily the most important. Okay, thank you very much. I see my time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, uh, I now recognize the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Maloney. Thank you, and I, I uh, particularly want to welcome uh, both of the panelists, and particularly uh, Mr. William Dudley, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Reserve Banks of New York. So welcome, Mr. Dudley. And I'd like to uh, begin questioning by asking you, regarding the, the Federal Reserve's foreign exchange swap lines, uh, can you tell me what your track record has been with these programs? Have they been successful? Have uh, there been any, any losses to the taxpayers? Have there been any gains for the taxpayers? And if so, how much? And welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your service, both of you. Thank, Thank you, you, Congressman Maloney. Um, the track record is excellent. I mean, in two dimensions. One, the swap lines that we've engaged with have accomplished the goal that we set for them, which is basically to support uh, U.S. financial markets and ensure the flow of credit to U.S. households and businesses. And two, we've managed to do this in a way that has been ex extraordinarily safe. Uh, as I noted earlier, uh, no losses uh, on any swap programs that we've ever engaged in going back to 1962. And in terms of the swaps that we enacted during the, uh, the financial crisis in 2008 and 2009 uh, and uh, ongoing uh, total profits for the taxpayer of about $4 billion. So no losses, profit for the taxpayer uh, has had the beneficial effect that we wanted in terms of supporting uh, the financial system uh, and supporting the flow of credit to U.S. households and businesses. So I think that they've worked very well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Uh, Kamen uh, uh, about uh, a statement that the Treasury Undersecretary uh, Bernard has stated that the administration's position in Europe is not uh, to seek additional funding for the IMF. And to quote her directly, she said, the challenge Europe faces is within the capacity of the Europeans to manage, end quote. Um, Europe accounts for roughly 16 percent of our uh, exports, in my opinion, if, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, accounting for the stabilization of many jobs here in the United States, probably thousands of jobs. Uh, what occurs abroad is going to have a direct effect on the recovery here at home in the United States. And do you believe the stabilization of European markets is critical to our economic recovery here at home, uh, making systems like the Federal Reserve foreign exchange swap lines uh, crucial? Uh, thank you, Congressman mm -hmm. Maloney. Um, in response to your questions, uh, first of all, I absolutely agree that it is critical uh, that the Europe financial and economic situation be stabilized. As you've pointed out, Europe is a major trading partner of the United States. And as we've discussed uh, earlier, its uh, financial conditions in Europe are highly intertwined with those in the United States. So uh, a stabilization of the European situation really is very important. Uh, both for the United States financial conditions as well as the continued growth of exports and the real economy and thus jobs. Uh, now as, re as regards the issue of IMF policy, 
Uh, the Treasury Department is our lead on that, and so uh, on the issue of IMF policy. So I can't speak directly uh, to their statements, uh, but I will note, as Treasury officials have noted as well, and, and, and as well as Federal Reserve officials, that you know Europe is a very the euro area is a very large and comparatively wealthy uh, economy, uh, you know, relative to many others in the world. Uh, and they do have very many substantial resources uh, that could be brought to bear on their situation. And so it's critical for them to do so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and Mr. Dudley, I'd like to ask you, as countries in international markets form individual firewalls to stave off residual financial distress, are we always and likewise creating firewalls, firewalls through various uh, other areas and policies uh, involving capital and liquidity requirements that could have an effect on our economy here in the United States? Well, we, th we think it's very important that to have a financial system that's resilient and robust, and, and towards that end, uh, Congress, administration, uh, the regulatory community in the U.S. has been working hard to uh, bolster the capital and liquidity among U.S. financial firms. And uh, I have to say that we're in a much better shape than we were a few years ago in both those uh, regards. And I think that's uh, you know, good news because it means that if there are shocks uh, emanating from abroad or emanating in the United States, the U.S. banks are in much better uh, shape to absorb those shocks and to continue to function and, and supply credit uh, to U.S. households and businesses. Uh, could I ask additional 10 seconds? So, so roughly, I'd just like to hear a yes or no. Do you believe that we should do everything we can to contain the European crisis, to ensure that there is no spillover here in the United States, and to stabilize that region and, and our own economy, yes or no? Well, I think we should do everything that's prudent uh, to stabilize yeah, the, Euro yeah. the European economy. Uh, obviously, we should do what's in our self-interest in mm -hmm. terms of what's best for the United States, mm -hmm. and all our co all our policies are uh, enacted with that with f through that prism. Okay, Dr. Kamen. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that was exactly my thought. Definitely everything everything that is prudent and appropriate. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, did Mr. Lukemeyer have a Unanimous consent request. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, ask unanimous consent to uh, place in the record the article from which I was referring this morning. It's a Market Watch article uh, by Andrea Thomas with regards to the comment um, of Executive Board Member Jurgen Stark. If you uh, without objection. Thank you, sir. Now recognize uh, Mr. Schweikert from Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Congressman Lukemeyer stole the, one of the number one questions I was uh, interested in pursuing, and that was the credit quality of. Um, uh, what's being pledged. Can I get into something that's a little more conceptual, but this one actually really does bother me. I'm trying to get my head around the interconnectivity of um, Euro-Yen, um, Euro's relationship, Singapore's, Euro, um, and ultimately, as we are providing interlocking you know, swap facilities, um, what happens when the debt cascade happens somewhere else in the world? Does that cascade end up tagging Europe, which tags us? And how much ultimately is there in true net reserves in central banks around the world when you start looking at the net borrowing compared to the net savings countries? And doctor, I'd love if you would start with that one. Uh, thank you, I'll, I'll be happy to. Um, so to start with, um as we've come to recognize only too well, um, we have a very globalized financial system. And disturbances that occur in one part of the world are transmitted around the world through numerous channels and through numerous markets. So, and that is, that is what we, we saw that quite evidently uh, during the global financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. And we've seen it more recently uh, with the European fiscal and financial crisis as deterioration. Mr. There. Chairman, Doctor, can I beg of you to oh, pull, I'm sorry. Just pull it a little closer? Th yep. Those mics are, are a little tough. Oh, thank you. We've seen it more recently uh, during the European financial crisis in 2000, uh, uh, in the last couple of years. So, um, in, in almost to that, what I'm, what I'm somewhat hunting is uh, I've been tracking some data coming out of Japan, and there's some very worrisome signs in you know, the net debt. 
um, how does that play into right. you know this interconnectivity? Well, so so what we've seen then is that uh, in situations that occur like this. Uh, some dollar funding problems, which is to say problems with banks getting funding in dollars in order to continue their flow of financing, they tend not to basically stay in one part of the world. There's a very easy uh, uh, capacity for those problems to spill out all over the world. And it was in large part for that reason that we didn't just establish the swap lines with the ECB. Uh, they were, we also established them with central banks around the world so that problems as they arose any, you know, in different parts of the world could be addressed. And as is evident from the data on the swap lines uh, that we publish in our, on our websites, the take up of the swap lines, in other words, the distribution of funds to uh, institutions in different regions has not been limited exclusively uh, to the Euro area, although that's where most of the money has gone. Mr. Dudley. I, I certainly agree with uh, Dr. Kamen's answer that the world is very interconnected and problems in one part of the world can definitely uh, have ripple effects through the other parts of the world. That's why we did set up uh, these swap lines with five central banks rather than just the European Central Bank. And there are some draws on those swap lines in, 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 uh, from other central, some, from uh, some of these other central banks. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dudley, and, and almost to that, the concept, help me get my head around. Um, considering the, the nature of our balance sheets today after the 2008 crisis, both Europe, United States, uh, uh, some of our partners in Japan are, are around other places of the world, if today Europe, this became a very hard recession and we had something like the tequila crisis from 15 years ago or some sort of cascade out there, do we have enough capacity, particularly if we also had um, different regions of the world competing also for access to those swap lines? Do you believe our balance sheets are capable uh, of stabilizing? I mean, it's hard to know, what, you know, what would happen in, you know, given scenarios. Uh, so it's hard to speculate. I think w one one thing that I think is important, though, is that the uh, foreign countries around the world are, you know, a bit more, a bit better protected themselves in terms of uh, sharp changes in capital inflows to capital outflows in the sense that they have very large foreign exchange reserves today compared to what they had 20 or 30 years ago. So the ability of countries to bear a reversal from capital inflows to capital outflows is much better generally around the world than it was well, 20 or 30 years and, ago. And part of that is my concern over the interest rate spike, um, particularly with you know our net debt coverage, you know the interest rate spike and where our WAM is on our U.S. sovereign debt, you know, a couple years of um, higher interest rates would be pretty devastating budget-wise. Um, well, so I'm just I'm fearful of a cascade somewhere else of truly affecting us. Well, yeah, I, I talked in a in a recent uh, speech about the debt service uh, problems for the U.S. that are, you know, not really visible yet because U.S. interest rates are so low. And if uh, we don't, if the U.S. does not get its fiscal house in order over the medium term, there is a chance that U.S. interest rates will rise, and that that debt interest burden on the U.S fiscal position will become quite significant. So this is just a, you know, another reason why uh, we, you know, the U.S. does need to get its fiscal house in order over the medium to longer term. Thank you for your tolerance, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, I thank the gentleman. Now I recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I thank you both for uh, being back. We had a similar hearing in my subcommittee on oversight and government reform, and, uh, you know, times uh, have changed slightly in the, in the uh, last couple of months, so I um, do want to touch on some of the things that I, I raised then um, just to see if things have, have changed. Uh, Mr. Dudley, um, can you explain under what circumstances the Fed would consider purchasing European sovereigns directly? We, the, the Federal Reserve has a small uh, foreign exchange reserve portfolio that we manage for ourselves and for Treasury, and so we do actually own a very small amount of European sovereign debts as part of that a foreign exchange reserves portfolio. Uh, with the exception of that portfolio, which we periodically roll over maturing mm -hmm. uh, securities, uh, I think the bar, as I said it in, in, our, in our hearing uh, a few months ago, was extraordinarily high for the U.S., for the Federal Reserve to actually go out and buy foreign sovereign debt for its own portfolio, apart from this very small foreign exchange reserves holdings that we have. So uh, roughly, have, what is uh, what are it, those what, what 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 dollar amount do we have? Uh, I think it's on the order of twenty twenty five billion dollars total. Uh, consists of cash, uh, 
of sovereign debt of a couple countries, and then there's some reverse repurchase agreements where we basically have executed against dealers and taken. So for the, for context, it's you tiny. Know. It's tiny, and it's basically 25 billion to to what of your total holdings? Just well, so we our, have our total portfolio is about uh, almost almost three trillion, not quite three trillion. Dollars. Okay, so it's de minimis and de minimis, in sort of and in, it hasn't interview. changed in size or composition. You know, you know, over. Do, a do you long. have statutory authority to expand that? I mean, could could you ramp it up to? Uh, you know, five hundred billion. Well, we have legal authority uh, under the Federal Reserve Act to buy foreign sovereign debt, but I think I don't see the circumstances under which we would ever be willing to do that, except for, for, with the exception of managing this foreign exchange reserve portfolio. Okay. Okay. Now, in terms of uh, in terms of the long-term refinancing operation, the um, European Central Bank has. Uh, Undertaken, you know, with three years, uh, three-year notes. Uh, in essence, it looks it looks similar in sort of concept to, to TARP, doesn't it? Uh, it's a little different in the sense that TARP was money that Congress uh, uh, appropriated, and then was used by the Treasury as capital to to put into banks or put into other entities to recapitalize them. Uh, the long-term refinancing operation is a loan from the European Central Bank to its banks against collateral that they pledge. So it's a lending operation, not a not a capital investment. So the program. TARP really wasn't a lending operation, seeing well, as they had to pay it back with pine, fines and penalties and interest. I mean, it seems to me TARP could be used for many purposes. I mean, it could be lent out and it could be used as capital. But if you look at how how the TARP money was used in 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 the bulk of it, the bulk of it was used for capital investment. Well, I, I think we're battling semantics here because, uh, in essence, they, they are similar in dollar amounts, uh, similar in, in terms of their intent. Now, really at the root, what is the European problem? Is it, is it a problem of, uh, of indebted countries? Is that the root of what we're contending with right now? I think it's, that's part of it. I mean, the part of it is you have some countries in Europe that have uh, budget deficits that are unsustainably high and debt burdens that are continuing to climb. So that's problem number one. But the problem number two is they're doing so in a system of 17 countries with a common currency where the individual countries don't have control of their own monetary policy. They don't have their own currency. And there's a lack of fiscal transfers within Europe to support countries that are in weaker position relative to those that are in stronger position. So there are some things that are very special about Europe's uh, that, are con that are part of the European Union, the system of, of how the system is arranged, that are very different than anything that applies to the United States. So what, what, what happened with much of this long-term refinancing operation, that, that capital, it flowed into uh, sovereign debt of, of, of a few countries, and in large part that's where mu much, of this, much of this flowed. But Dr. Uh, Dr. Kamen, um, in terms of what, what that actually did, We've actually bought some time and space for for a few highly indebted countries. Is that basically what's happened? Well, I think that um, it's possible that the uh, oh, thank you. It's possible that the uh, effects of the L LTRO, in combination with the other measures that have been taken, uh, basically might have some somewhat longer-term benefits. To be specific about that, it is true, as you say, that probably some of the LTRO uh, money uh, did flow to the purchase of sovereign bonds. But perhaps the more important thing that the LTRO funds did was that it alleviated many concerns uh, by the market about the liquidity position and the financial position more generally of European banks. And so the, the way in which that may have led to reductions in the sovereign yields of some embattled European governments was not just directly they had the funds they could use them, but indirectly because European banks felt more solid in their financial position and more comfortable being able to buy these bonds. In turn, that improved situation in terms of European banks in the eyes of the markets may have led investors to believe that therefore European governments would not in turn be called upon to support banks. So there was a sort of a virtuous circle in process here, which has so far been very beneficial in terms of improving uh, the tenor of markets. Now, all that said, you are absolutely right that this, uh, the LTROs, the provision of liquidity by itself cannot be the only thing that will solve the European crisis. It's very important that European leader leaders work on a number 
of more lasting and fundamental issues. Uh, one of them is they need to actually make the, the uh, financial backstops for European governments higher and stronger, and that's a discussion they're having. They also need, quite obviously, and this is, this is very challenging, to actually follow through on their many commitments to improve their fiscal situation. And finally, uh, a as we've discussed here today, uh, improved fiscal performance must be buttressed by improved growth performance. And that is particularly challenging uh, for the peripheral European economies. And so they are going to have to follow through on a lot of fairly rigorous structural reforms. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It sounds like uh, psychology and economics are getting closer and closer in, in these current crisis times. I, I think they always have been. I thank the gentleman. <clears throat> I want to follow up on this issue about how it's going to help our consumers here at home when we make these loans overseas. And I think, Mr. Dudley, you indicated that you already have some evidence that that has been helpful, or uh, are you just saying that if we do it, it could be helpful? No, I think, I mean, you know, the evidence is, 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 is soft evidence rather than hard evidence, but we've been w monitoring the performance of the European banks who do business in the U.S. Uh, quite closely because uh, they were having trouble getting dollar funding. Uh, money market mutual funds who were providing dollar funding to the European banks uh, during the summer and fall were pulling back. Other lenders, uh, large asset managers, were also pulling back from the European banks, and this was causing those banks to start to uh, get out of their dollar book of business. They were trying to sell off loans and pull back in terms of their willingness to provide credit. Uh, this was going on at a, at a pretty feverish pitch through the late fall and into the early winter. And I wouldn't say that it stopped, uh, but, it's, but, it, but what, I, what the sense we get is it's happening now in a much more orderly way, uh, not leading to the fire sale of assets at low prices, not leading to downward pressure on financial markets, not leading to uh, a constraint in credit availability to U.S. households and businesses. So from what I can tell, we're seeing the, door, the, the deleveraging of the European banks is continuing, but it's happening in an orderly way rather than a disorderly way, which is what, which is what, what our objective is. So you don't ha actually have a quantity, a, a number that you, you can no, we don't have and the say that they did such and such to the consumers back here at home. We don't have the detailed sort of right. uh, data on that, but, but we do have discussions with those well, banks. It, it seems like there's a conflict, at least in my mind, of the need to send uh, more currency swaps over there when the banks, I think the top eight banks in, in Europe actually had a tremendous increase in their reserves, a 50% increase in, in one year. So why do they need more money? Why do they need more? It, it, it's already there. What about our banks? Our banks have $1.5 trillion. If it's a good deal, and uh, these, uh, uh, these bailouts or these purchases that, that you want them to do by having these currency swaps to help the banks uh, and give the central banks to help buy some of this debt, uh, if it's a good deal for anybody, why, do, why wouldn't some of our banks they have $1.5 trillion? It seems like you're doing something that the market doesn't want you to do, and there's a reason. Maybe it's way, uh, way too risky. And if we're sending money over to the European banks with the hope, but no evidence yet, actually some of this money coming back <clears throat> and actually stimulating our economy, why, why is it that just more, more credit and more money in the system is going to work? If, if our banks are holding $1.5 trillion, there's something more to it than, than lack of uh, the ability or the lack of the willingness of the Fed to just endlessly create more and more credit. Why, why is it going to work better by just pumping more into, say, a European bank if the goal, so you emphasize the help it's going to do, you do it out of the interest of the American consumer. You, diminishes, you diminish the uh, possibility that it might be done to just prop up the banks, you know, because they're in, they're in over their heads. Uh, uh, <clears throat> that they may have credit default swaps, uh, and uh, th the banks over there, it's, they're all, um, it's global, they have branches over there, it's just to prop up a system that 
is, is not viable. Uh, so w w why is there a disconnect? There seems to be a lot of money there. Why do you feel compelled that we have to keep uh, uh, sending more in order that it, hopefully it will help our consumers here at home? Well, I think that the, the, the U.S. banking system is a very different place than the European banking system. The U.S. banks have plenty of dollar assets that they can, uh, the monies that they can lend. They gather deposits through their retail branch networks here. So they, they, they don't have any a shortage of dollar funds in which they can lend. The European banks were, were, were in a different position because they were dependent on the wholesale funding market to provide them with dollars. And as the, Euro, as the European situation deteriorated last summer and fall, U.S. investors that had been providing dollars to these European banks were pulling back. And it was that pulling back and that difficulty for, for European banks to uh, gain access to the wholesale dollar funding market, which was f forcing them to pull back in terms of their willingness to lend to U.S. households and businesses. U.S. banks don't need dollar liquidity right now, so there's no, they're, and they're not deleveraging. The issue is the European banks, their bo dollar book of business, they were having trouble funding that book of business, and that's why they were pulling back. But what, when they're holding all these reserves, if it were any advantage at all, they would do it. Obviously, there's no advantage to even helping out Europe. I mean, there's no law against them uh, loaning the money, is there? Why, why do you feel compelled that you have to do something that the banks that are holding all this money won't, won't do it? Well, I think that the European situation was creating a lot of uh, anxiety about the health of the European banking system because the health of the European banking system was tied up with the health of uh, the, the individual uh, national economies in terms of their fiscal positions. And the ECB basically has been trying to find a way to cut that tie. And I think that the long-term refinancing operations and the dollar swaps have sort of calmed down the anxiety in the market. And what we've actually seen now, since the long-term refinancing operations have been put in place by the ECB and the dollar swaps have been put in place by us, we've actually seen financing pressures in Europe subside. So the rates that the European banks have to pay for, to borrow from other European banks or to borrow from U.S. banks in dollars, that's, those rates have actually been coming down. So that's actually a beneficial uh, consequence of the long-term refinancing operations and the dollar swap programs. So the yeah, pressure in the markets are abating, which I think is a good thing. I recognize Mr. Lukemeyer from Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, kind of curious, where, uh, who, who determines the, uh, the rate for the swap lines? Interest rate? The interest rate is established by the Federal Open Market Committee in discussions with the foreign central banks. Obviously, they have to agree to the rate that we are willing to uh, how how often is it re reviewed to go up or down? How often do you review that? Quarterly, semi-annually, once a year? Well, the swap lines are outstanding, for example. The current set of swap lines are outstanding until February 1st, 2013. But we certainly, you know, we certainly could review them at any The rate doesn't float? At any point in time. The rate is, the rate is set at the, essentially at the federal funds rates plus 50 basis points. So right now, it's about six-tenths of a percent okay. interest rate. But, but, but the, 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 the amount above the Fed funds rate that, that stays constant uh, and for the entire length of the, the swap, or do you, do you float that or adjust it, that as well? It had been at 100 basis points right. over, the, over the federal funds rate up until last, last, last fall. And then we lowered that spread to, from 100 basis points to 50 basis points. And the reason why we lowered that rate is that European banks were reluctant to use the swaps because they felt that using the swaps at, at, at that rate would be a sign of weakness and so the swaps were actually not being very effective in containing pressure in, in financial markets. So a decision was made by us and the foreign central banks in which we've engaged with the swaps was to lower the rate from 100 basis points over the federal funds rate to 50 basis points over the If the European rate. banks felt it was in their own best interest not to borrow money, not to swap, because the rate was too high, why would you want to entice them into this with a lower rate? They were reluctant to use the swap because they felt that if they used it, it would be a sign that they were particularly weak institutions. Why is it? Why are they not viewed as weak now? Because they're using it now. Because when we when the swap rate was lowered to from 100 basis points over the federal funds rate to 50 basis points over the federal funds rate, it became broadly attractive to the rates that were then in place in markets. It so made them look like better investors. Better, it made them look like better investors, better money managers. Uh, it made them. It, there, there was an economic rationale for borrowing from the swap lines at the lower rate. So lots of banks participated. And since lots of banks participated, there was, no, there was very little stigma 
from, particip for, from participating in that program? This whole, this whole thing is held together by confidence and, and perception that there is a, that everybody's doing okay, isn't it? Well, I think we've seen both in the case of the swaps and in the case of our own discount window in the U.S. that there's times that banks don't want to use uh, liquidity facilities, backstop facilities, because it's a f they're afraid that it's going to show that they're weak relative to other institutions. And that's, that's just a, 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 a problem in terms of these type of liquidity facilities. I'm just kind of curious, you know, I follow up on Chairman Paul's line of questioning with regards to uh, loaning, or the ECB loaning it to the banks and the banks turn around and, and loaning it to our American, I guess, companies and investors here. Uh, why would they do that? Well, the why European are they not borrowing the money from us directly, our well, banks Euro here? Well, the European banks have, you know, big books of business in the U.S. in areas, especially in areas like trade finance, project finance, reserve energy, you know, the end against, lend against uh, oil and gas drilling, energy reserves, and they have specialized expertise in these areas. And so that's why they undertake this business around the world. And in the U.S., when they partake in this business, they do it in terms of lending dollars, because obviously that's what the currency that we do business here in the, in the United States. And so they have a need for dollars to be able to sustain the, that business. So what you're saying is that there are banks in Europe that are better experts at lending in certain areas, certain fields, than we have lending institutions in this country. Is that what you just said? I'm saying that there are European banks that are sp specialized in certain areas. Now, whether they're better than, than, or, or worse than the U.S. banks that per participate in the same areas, you know, there's some overlap in terms of competitive, you know, in, in areas of competition, but there's certain areas where European banks historically have concentrated uh, their lending. Yeah. Project finance, trade finance, and energy reserve lending are probably three of the most uh, predominant examples. Now, do, do the, do the uh, American corporations or entities that borrow from them, are they bar uh, buying goods and services from Europe then? Are they buying goods and services someplace else in the world, the United States, or does it kind of, kind of work like our Export-Import export Bank here, or how does that work? Well, I would, I would presume that uh, if you're borrowing in dollars, you're using those dollars to buy U.S. goods and services. Otherwise, uh, you wouldn't need the dollars. You'd need some, some other form of currency. Yeah. Congressman, if I, c if I could add, um, uh, we, we're in the middle, w this is a, a very global financial system, and we're in the middle of a very global economic system. So, you know, large, uh, large banks operate all around the world uh, and compete with each other, and, and that actually ends up being beneficial to non-financial corporations. Well, I, I understand that, uh, Dr. Kim, but I'm, I'm trying to get at, I'm kind of concerned here because we have foreign banks that are apparently competing against American banks, with what you just said, yet we are loaning money through the ECBA, or excuse me, through the ECB, to those banks to be able to loan back and compete against our banks. Is that what you just said? Well, uh, um, what I said was just that, that uh, both financial institutions and non-financial institutions compete with each other all around the world. That, that yeah, but my concern is that we, if we're, we, through these swap, li swap lines, are funding these international banks, and they are in turn competing against our banks, I don't think we need to be doing that. Do you? Well, the primary concern of the Federal Reserve in setting up the swap lines was to maintain the flow of credit uh, to American households and firms. That, that was key because that's what's needed in order to maintain the economic recovery and to, and to move toward achieving our dual mandate of both price stability and maximum sustainable employment. So that, that was the critical factor that motivated. Yeah, I, mean, I think the U.S. banks uh, also are interested in having a healthy U U.S. economy, just like the European banks are. And I think that they probably broadly recognize that a forced liquidation of assets by European banks would have you know, negative consequences for the U.S. economy and for their banks. I see my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize uh, Mr. McHenry. Five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to follow up on the earlier question I had um, about the uh, long-term refinancing operation. Now, it, it's interesting to me, Dr. Kamen, it, you, you did walk through the whole thought process, and, and I do appreciate that. I mean, the willingness to have a, a witness from a, um, um, an independent institution that Congress oversees to walk through in sort of a, a very broad form um, your thinking on this is, is rather impressive and dare say revolutionary, um, uh, but, but it was uh, very much appreciated. Um, 
because you know th this is really just about trying to make sure policymakers on the Hill have an awareness of what the Fed is doing, um, and I don't have to explain to the Fed that the chairman of this subcommittee's uh, vigorous intention of over oversight of the Federal Reserve. Um, that may be the understatement of the day, but um, so <clears throat> with this injection of funds, of uh, you know low interest rate loans for an extended period of time, um, s much of this capital, a large portion of this capital, I should say, uh, of all the categories, has gone to sovereign debt. This is now TROs. Yes. Thank you. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, so. In that operation, the money has flowed to sovereign debt, so it, it, it has had one of the intended effects from the ECB, it appears. Now, the, the question is, of course, what is our exposure to Europe, right, in terms of a quantifiable uh, dollar amount? Um, by our private sector, it's one question, but really the, the bigger question here for policymakers is, what is our exposure as a, as a government and it, the Federal Reserve's explo exposure to Europe. Uh, th thank you, uh, Congressman McHenry, for, for your kind remarks earlier thank and you. for these questions. Um, the Federal Reserve exposure to Europe um, would, uh, to, would, be, would be basically encompassed by the, with the, by the value of our swap lines, which is around $50 uh, billion uh, dollars or so. Uh, to the ECB, and then a very small amount uh, to the Swiss National Bank. Um, the um, as as we have discussed earlier, uh, we think that those um, exposures are very secure. We've provided them with dollars in exchange; they've provided us with their currency, and we we appreciate the prudent management and strong financial position of the ECB. Uh, the the uh, the exposure of our private financial institutions. Uh, to Europe is obviously much, much larger, uh, both our banks and our money market funds. Uh, those exposures to the most embattled uh, so-called uh, countries in Europe, um, particularly like Greece and Portugal and Ireland, are really uh, very small. Uh, the exposures to Spain and Italy are uh, somewhat larger, uh, but we've had you know, many discussions uh, with the banks that we supervise, and those are viewed to be quite manageable. Obviously, the exposures to core European banks, who are in turn exposed to peripheral Europe, are much larger. Um, but we are, uh, in terms of thinking about the channels of spillover and how this exposure really works, uh, what's probably more uh, of concern is not so much these direct financial exposures to European institutions, but rather the fact that if situation in Europe took a turn for the worse, there will be these ancillary channels that we've talked about before, the disruptions of financial markets, the retreat from risk-taking that could disrupt financial markets around the world. And that's, that's really a matter of the greater concern. And that's where we focus a lot of our efforts uh, in working with the banks that we supervise and other regulatory institutions taking the same standpoint to the banks. So, so explain to me how uh, the, the swap lines benefit the American economy, just in layman's terms. Sure. Um, to begin with, um, many European financial institutions, as we've discussed, uh, are engaged in direct uh, extensions of credit to U.S. households and firms. In a situation where, th where these uh, European banks were unable to get the dollar funding they needed, they would be forced to pull back on lending from U.S. households and firms. They might be forced to sell assets which would then depress asset values in the U.S. economy more generally. And both of those uh, effects would, uh, would directly affect the ability of U.S. households and firms to grow and prosper. On top of that, funding difficulties by these European banks would lead to their cutback on credit to, you know, in terms of dollar lending to other firms around the world, firms which buy a lot of U.S. exports. And so that would be an additional channel uh, you know, through which uh, a funding shortage uh, could hurt the U.S. economy, and that's what we intend, hope to alleviate through the provision of these funds. Finally, um, in the event uh, that the dollar funding were not available, say in the absence of our swap lines, and European banks ran into more severe difficulties, this could be a, 
a contributing factor to a further and renewed deterioration of European financial conditions that not only could severely impact the European economy, perhaps promote a recession, but lead to distressed conditions around the world. So there might be more larger ancillary effects from dollar funding problems that, again, the, the dollar swap lines are intended to alleviate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Heisinger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity and, and uh, for you coming in. And I uh, wanted to maybe touch on a couple of quick things and continue on that, that uh, currency swaps. Um, how, how far are we going to bring this along, I guess, would be part of my, part of my question. How long are we going to stick into this, uh, this game and be a part of it? If Europe, Europe remains dependent on currency swaps, these same swaps become increasingly risky. Um, is, are you prepared to allow these currency swaps to wind down, or, or what's going to happen there? And then um, yeah, the, the short-term dollar funding in Europe seemed to be the, the discussion point, right? How would you define short-term versus medium-term and, and long-term? I'll, I'll, I'll start. Or, you know, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Uh, you know, I think that uh, what we would hope is that the European countries do the right things in terms of getting their fiscal houses in order and, be, and improving their competitiveness so that investors start to have more confidence in uh, the sustainability of the European Union and, 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 and how all these countries are going to uh, persist. Uh, as, uh, if that happens, and at the, and if, as at the same time, uh, the European banks uh, are shown to have good earnings, liquidity, and capital, then I think that the willingness of private uh, lenders to provide dollar liquidity to the European banks will emerge uh, very much intact. And in that situation, our swaps will be at rates that are actually higher than the market, and the swap programs will just sort of wind down automatically. Uh, this is what we Kay. saw during 2007, 2008, 2009, during the first big wave of swaps, that as market conditions normalized, the swap usage came down pretty automatically. Well, I'm kind of curious about that because I'm looking at some information uh, in front of me here that says interest rates on dollar loans from the ECB are around 0.6%. Uh, uh, interest rate on ECB charges uh, for its euro loans is 1%. Um, I, I don't have my PhD in economics. However, I can see the incentive there. I mean, uh, why, why, by making dollar financing cheaper than euro financing, how are they ever going to get out of that cycle? Well, the, 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 I, I'm, I'm not sure that I would agree with that, that that's, that's the right comparison. The 1% is to borrow euros. The 0.6% is to borrow dollars. And the alternative is to borrow dollars from a U.S. bank when the Federal Reserve is paying 25 basis points on the interest rate that we pay on excess reserves. So there's quite a bit of room between the 25 basis points we pay on reserves here in the U.S. and the 0.6% uh, on the dollar swap. So we, we would expect that if conditions in Europe were to improve, continue to improve, that the rate at which European banks could borrow dollars would be somewhat north of 25 basis points, perhaps, but below that 0.6%. So we would think that the, there's plenty of room in that difference for the European banks to obtain credit from private, pri private entities. And in fact, we've actually seen uh, private uh, suppliers of dollars to the European banks return uh, subsequent to the large long-term re uh, refinancing operations and the dollar swap program. So but it looks like but the but doesn't market's that already starting to normalize. The dollar but doesn't that weaken the value of the euro, what they're doing? Uh, I, you know, if you look at, you know, I think the euro is really basically being trading uh, in line with how the situation in Europe yeah. looks. If is, As the European situation worsens, the euro depreciates. As the European situation improves, the euro appreciates. Uh, so it's really based on the outlook for Europe of course, relative to the outlook in the U.S. But if I could help me understand, though, it's if a weaker euro, doesn't that mean a, 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 a typically a weaker eurozone, since we have sort of flagged this off as a European issue and are trying not to get dragged into it here from, from the U.S. side? Well, you're, you're certainly right that if the European outlook were to deteriorate, the euro would probably w uh, weaken as a consequence. Uh, the good news is over the last you know, four or five months, the euro has actually strengthened a bit because Europe has actually made some progress in terms of addressing some of their issues. 
Okay, and then I, my time is almost up, and I'll, I know, uh, Dr. Kamen, you want to say something as well, but I'm, just, I'm curious, what keeps you up at night? What other countries? I mean, you specifically, I think, in Dr. Kamen's testimony, talked briefly about Greece, and then you just were touching on uh, Spain and Portugal, but, you know, where are we? At Italy, Ireland, um, and are we on solid footing, or I'm sorry, are they on solid footing in France and Germany and, and uh, some of those other countries that have been leading this? Well, well um, cer certainly the Euro uh, crisis in general is what keeps me up at night and, and what uh, occupies much of my thinking time during the day as well. Uh, obviously, uh, the uh, situation of Greece has been very difficult and we've been following that very closely. Uh, we also obviously are very focused on, on basically you know, Ireland and um, Portugal, which are the recipients of IMF funds. And we think it's critically important that these problems not uh, move further into Spain and Italy, which have also been the focus of market attention. So, a and we think it's absolutely critical to make sure that you don't have further uh, uh, contagion beyond that. So far, things have been looking on the brighter side. There have been improvement in markets, but we have continued to monitor the situation as closely as ever. And then, while most of my thinking lately is focused on Europe, uh, obviously I'm thinking about oil prices as well, because that is another uh, area uh, that poses a potential uh, threat, at least down the road. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, have a couple additional questions I'd like to ask. <coughs> I'm interested in the uh, one, l <coughs> excuse me, one line on the. Uh, Federal Reserve uh, uh, sheet at the, each week on other assets, uh, other Federal Reserve assets. And it's been growing a bit. It used to be a small number, uh, but even in recent years it's gone up. I think it's about $160 uh, billion now. Uh, what, what does that include? Does that include anything foreign? Is there any type of a, of a foreign asset or a swap or anything in, involved in there that would help me further understand this international financial uh, crisis that we're in? Um, oh, go ahead. Uh, Chairman Paul, um, um, the, uh, the critic, the, the, um, we, we definitely put in our, on our balance sheet, we list ex, you know, our, our holdings of foreign assets. I don't recall offhand if, if, if that's where the other assets is. I don't think so. The, f the other assets have, as you, as you point out, have risen over time. And the, there's a one main uh, contributing factor to that, which is when we, when we buy securities in the market, um, sometimes they, we, we, we buy them at a value that's above their par or face value because interest rates uh, had declined since they were first issued, and that raises the value of those securities. So then we place the par value of the securities in one line on our balance sheet, and then that additional part that's over the par value, the premium, that's placed in our other assets line. So as we have continued to purchase securities in the market, that, uh, that the, the amount of those, the premium part of our purchases which has gone into the other assets line has continued to rise. So you say you're buying uh, securities. Would this be my mortgage securities? Uh, this would be prim pr predominantly the maturity extension program in which we're selling short-dated treasury securities and buying long-dated treasury securities. Mm -hmm. uh, we are also buying mortgage-backed securities, but w that's just rolling over existing maturing mm -hmm. mortgage-backed right. securities. So the size of the mortgage-backed securities por portfolio is pretty constant. So the significant increase up to $160 billion of just saying there are other, it's, it's definitely related to the uh, international financial crisis that we're involved in right now? As, as Steve related, it's, it's, it's related to the uh, expansion of the Fed's balance sheet and the types of assets that we're buying in the market. So, so the maturity extension program, we're selling short-dated treasuries, we're buying long-dated treasuries. To the extent that we're buying treasuries that are selling above par because interest rates have declined, that difference is what Steve was saying is booked in the other assets category. What, what, what does this mean, that this would continue to grow at the rate it's growing now? No, I mean, I would expect that uh, once, you know, w w once the uh, uh, maturity extension program and other asset purchase programs, you know, are ended, then I would expect the other assets category actually would probably come down o over time as that premium was, exactly. was amortized over time. Yeah. Chairman There's Paul. So it's a temp I would view this as a temporary phenomenon. 
Yeah. But there's no one place in the Federal Reserve reports that would give me a full explanation of exactly what the 160 is. You don't send out a report each month and, and say exactly what that's made up of? Um, there, there is an, uh, an interactive portion of our website uh, that offers more, uh, more analysis uh, of, you know, of the different lines. That's the first thing. The second thing I want to follow up on is having checked okay. that other, the other assets. Um, I just think the other assets category does indeed, as you suggest, uh, also include foreign currency denominated assets, but not the swap lines. It's the other uh, uh, European and yen denominated um, uh, securities that we hold. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the other thing I've noticed in the, since 2008 is if you look at a long-term chart of currency in circulation, it's a steady increase and very predictable. But since 2008, it's been going up much more rapidly. Where, where, where's the cash? This is cash. <laughs> this is currency. Uh, where, where's the demand for more cash? Do you know exactly where that goes? Does that end up overseas or is that in circulation here or is it in a shoebox someplace? Probably in, in, in probably in both places. I mean, with interest rates this low, the opportunity cost of holding more currency obviously is very low. It's, you know, if you hold the currency, you get a zero percent return. But if you, as you've gone to your bank these days, you don't get much more than that. So people probably are carrying around more currency in their pockets because there's less, less cost mm -hmm. of holding the currency versus holding it in a bank. This may also be true internationally, uh, although I'm not, I'm not familiar with how much currency mm. you know, is held here versus abroad. I know historically it's been about one-third here, two-thirds abroad, but I don't know how, how, much, how that's been changing recently. I, 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 our hearing is going to finish, but I have one quick question for both of you. You can probably answer this uh, rather uh, easily. You, you're, you're very much involved in dealing with uh, the value of our money, the value of our dollar, and our financial system. But I, I have trouble finding uh, a legal definition for the unit of account that we have and as a dollar. Could you tell me, give me your definition of what is a dollar? Well, I, I view the dollar as the legal tender in the United States so that if someone pays a dollar uh, as a payment, the, the shopkeeper has to accept that dollar uh, for, that, for that transaction. It's also, uh, I mean, the classic definition of money, I think, is it has three things. It's a store of value, store of value which uh, it's a, me you know, it's a medium of transactions. And usually it's portability. Yes. It? And then it's a medium of accounts. In other words, you measure value by using the dollar. But you, you do realize there was a more precise definition of a dollar most of our history where you could actually know what it meant. But it seems like that's no definition at all. <laughs> to say it's just a unit of account. So, and that's probably the reason why we've lost about 98% of the value of that dollar uh, since 1913, since uh, it's been the responsibility of the Federal Reserve to protect the value of our currency. So um, I, I have trouble believing that we'll be able to solve any of our problems financially or, or uh, uh, e even fiscally if we uh, can create money endlessly and out of thin air and accommodate the politicians who spend money, who spend money overseas, who spend money on foreign policies, uh, indirectly you have to deal with. What, what, uh, look how the sanctions and the threat of war in Iran affects the finances of, of the world, not only perception-wise and trade and pushing up oil prices, but, but also the, the need to keep monetizing this debt. Uh, Federal Reserve Chairman endlessly, for all the years I've been here, have always said, well, if the Congress would quit spending so much money and didn't have so much debt, we wouldn't have such a tough problem, you know, managing the, the, the currency. Uh, at, 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 this, at, the same, at the same time, uh, the debt wouldn't be there if the Federal Reserve wasn't there willing to monetize the debt because you are the lender of last resort. You guarantee the moral hazard that politicians are going to spend money. And uh, it, it seems like uh, to coordinate the two and have a sound economic system instead of a financial bubble that's based on debt and a, a monetary standard based on debt with a world awash and exploding amount of debt, uh, it, it seems 
I don't know how we'll ever get out of this unless we come up with, finally, a definition once again of what the unit of account is and what a dollar means. This, this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you.